Hello everybody, welcome to another webinar in the series that we're producing at the Anaphylaxis Campaign. Um, our webinar today uh, is about nutrition and allergy and the title is When Nutrition and Allergy Collide, The Rise of Reactions to Plant Foods. And to take part in the presentation today, I'm so pleased to welcome Dr. Isabel Scapala. Um, I've known Isabel for many years, since I joined the anaphylaxis campaign, in fact, um, 12 years ago. And Isabel has been such a good friend to the anaphylaxis campaign. She's been a very long standing member of our clinical and scientific panel. She gives lots of advice to our helpline on various issues when we, uh, we receive certain requests for information. Uh, she's helped us in the production of our various uh, information items, fact sheets, knowledge base, etc. So it's great that she can join us today. Um, Isabel is a consultant dietitian and she leads the adult food allergy department um, at the Brompton. Uh, she's also an honorary senior lecturer uh, at Imperial College. She's an international speaker. She's, she's spoken at IACI, at BSACI. She's produced several papers and is an acknowledged expert in this field. So I'm absolutely delighted that she's agreed to do this presentation for us today. So without further ado, I will hand over to Isabel. We will, uh, after Isabel's presentation, there will probably be some time for questions. We've received a lot of questions from you all and we'll get through as many as we can. Um, if we don't get through them all, or if you have a question that occurs to you during the presentation, do send it in because we will do a Q&A, uh, which we will put up on our website after this webinar. So without further ado, I will hand over to Isabel. Great, thanks very much, Lynn. Um, I'm just going to share my screen now um, and hopefully, um, hopefully, uh, hopefully you can see that all now. Lynn, can you just tell me that's okay? Yes, that's perfect. Great, okay. So thank you very much for asking me to speak. It's always a pleasure to um, support the anaphylaxis campaign and the great work that you do. And so I'm going to talk about something which, as you say, has become a bit of my life's work and that's plant food allergy. So um, we all know about uh, the role of nutrition in allergic disease. Um, and um, so, uh, it's obviously important in the prevention of food allergy and also in the dietary management of food allergy. And in fact, uh, we know that dietary diversity in young children um, is very important too. And that's particularly uh, introducing fruits and vegetables and uh, cereal foods. Um, there's very good research to show that uh, eating vegetables uh, and fruits uh, do uh, have a, a good effect on uh, allergic disease such as asthma and dermatitis. Um, but we also know that fruits and vegetables can cause allergies and this is data from the uh, Great Isle of Wight Cohort Study, <clears throat> which had tracked children through from birth. And this is, th this is their data up to this point uh, when they, uh, the children became 18 years old. And this data on the very right hand side is from uh, a, a research study I undertook um, looking at the prevalence of reported food allergy in adults. And vegetables and fruits are, uh, in fact, for adults, almost uh, account for almost half of all of the foods reported to cause an allergy. And you can see that in, in the 18 year olds, they're also important. But actually, if you look back through the ages, you can see that even very young children often report allergies to fruits and vegetables. Whereas we tend to think of, of milk and egg being important, and of course they are, 
but I think it's important to remember that fruits and vegetables can cause allergy at any age, <clears throat> but actually they're not always an obvious allergen. Um, if we look, uh, thinking about my own practice and, and some of the patients I've seen over the years, I've seen pretty severe reactions to a whole variety of different types of plant foods. Um, and I think given the uh, introduction of more and more uh, foods, especially into the UK that we may not have had uh, access to before, this is uh, an ongoing problem. So um, I'm going to talk really mainly about two uh, major plant food allergies, pollen food syndrome, and lipid transfer protein allergy, which is a bit of a new kid on the block, but very much an important uh, coming uh, food allergy. But I want to start by just mentioning briefly that obviously people can have an allergy to the fruit itself. Um, this was some data published by the Europreval cohort looking at kiwi fruit allergy. Uh, and they looked at it across the whole of Europe, so North Europe, West or Central Europe, East and South, Southern Europe. And they looked at a, a number of different allergens in the kiwi fruit. And what they showed was that if you lived in Northern Europe, you were much more likely to be allergic to the kiwi itself because you were sensitized to this allergen, which is a primary allergen in kiwi fruit. Um, whereas if you were <clears throat> in uh, Western or Central Europe, uh, you were more likely to be uh, actually having a problem with this allergen, ACT D8, which is a PR10 allergen along with profilins cause pollen food syndrome. And then there were some in the South where um, LTP, the LTP in Kiwi uh, was responsible for more of the uh, the uh, reactions there. So you can, of course, have a primary allergy to a particular uh, fruit or vegetable. But uh, when we think about fruit and vegetable allergy in the UK, uh, pollen food syndrome, also known as oral allergy syndrome, is the most common um, type of food allergy that we see, uh, especially in the adult clinic. Now this uh, involves rapid onset, usually mild or moderate symptoms in the mouth and throat. So tingling, itching and swelling. Um, it usually involves raw, raw, raw foods such as tree nuts, apples and stone fruits. And in the UK, it's particularly linked with people who are allergic to birch tree pollen, which causes hay fever in the springtime. And we know that about two thirds of people with birch pollen sensitization may get pollen food syndrome. And it's also more likely in people who are multiply sensitized. So they may not only be sensitized to birch pollen, but also to grass pollen and weeds pollens. And it's not just birch pollen. Um, Profilin is the uh, major allergen that causes pollen food syndrome in many other countries. Um, Profilins are uh, present in different uh, plants such as grass and weeds. Mugwort uh, is a big uh, uh, profilin containing weed that is very common cause of pollen food syndrome in Eastern Europe. Ragweed uh, again is present in some European countries but very common in the, uh, the USA. And of course, Timothy grass, again, is a very common allergen, although in the UK, pollen food syndrome is more likely to be linked to a birch pollen than to grass pollen, whereas in other parts of Europe, grass pollen plays a major role. And this uh, uh, chart underneath just shows that in uh, the UK, grass is the main sensitizing allergen, uh, but um, whereas in um, Poland uh, mugwort is the major sensitizing uh, allergen. So what are the symptoms? Well, as I said, they're rapid, they're localized, uh, and they tend to affect the throat, the mouth, and sometimes also the ears and making your eyes itchy. Um, traditionally, everyone has always thought that pollen food syndrome causes mild reactions and it can do and it certainly does. Some people have very mild reactions and a lot depends on how much of the food they've actually eaten. 
So if we think about these allergens, these allergens are not stable, so they're not in cooked foods, um, but they are more concentrated in some foods. So peanuts and tree nuts, for example, have a much higher level of protein and therefore a much higher level of these PR10 allergens than, for example, an apple might do. So you might get a much more severe reaction by eating four hazelnuts than you would to eating an apple. However, if you had a glass of freshly squeezed apple juice, you would probably get more allergen than, than that. So it's the amount of allergen that will dictate often the severity of the reaction. For example, in soy milk, Glyam 4 is the allergen in soy that cross-reacts with birch pollen. And soy milk therefore contains a lot of Glyam 4, uh, as does tofu. Uh, but the soy bodybuilding powders contain a very large amount of Glyam 4. So uh, thinking about people who are obviously trying to improve their health by having fruit smoothies, fresh juices, and perhaps going to the gym and uh, having some extra protein powders, these are the people who are perhaps more at risk of having a more severe reaction. Uh, Profilin allergy can also cause severe reactions and that's been shown in uh, publications from Spain and Portugal. There are certain fruits and jackfruit is, is becoming a real problem, uh, pollen food syndrome food, uh, in the UK. It's obviously a traditionally eaten elsewhere in the world, but of course many people in the UK eat jackfruit and it's also being used as a, as a meat substitute. Um, and cooked jackfruit may not be such a problem, but a lot of people eat it raw and it can cause much more severe reactions and we're not really sure why that is. Uh, there is a thought that people taking gastric acid suppressants or, or perhaps have had surgery, uh, they may be at more of a risk of a high, uh, a more severe reaction. And um, there are uh, some evidence to suggest that reactions can be made worse if you eat the food and you also, uh, it's linked to maybe exercise or alcohol. And I'll talk a bit more about cofactors uh, a bit later. And so some studies have definitely reported that people with pollen food syndrome report anaphylaxis. Uh, one study, this was from Korea, found that nearly 10% of patients with pollen food syndrome had more severe reactions. And in fact, one of the uh, risk factors was the number of different foods that were involved in their reactions. So how common is it? Well, we did a study a few years ago now and this uh, map of the UK just shows the GP uh, practices that kindly took part in that study. And what we found was that um, the prevalence of uh, pollen food syndrome in the UK is 2%. But as you can see from this uh, graph on the right hand side, that it was much higher in London. And in fact, Peterhead was, had the lowest level of uh, pollen food syndrome. And that may be because in Peterhead, uh, although they do have trees in Scotland, they don't have the kind of trees that would cause pollen food syndrome. They were much more sensitized to grass. So, but maybe London is high because we have the trees, the birch trees, but we also have high levels of pollution. And that has also been linked to higher levels of pollen food syndrome. Now, of course, we, as, as uh, Lynn has said, I see adults with food allergy, but um, uh, many people had thought originally that pollen food syndrome didn't occur in children, but actually we know it does. Uh, this is data from this same study. Uh, when we asked people with pollen food syndrome how old they were when they first had their symptoms, you can see that the most common age was 10 to 14 years, followed by 15 to 19 years and then another rise in the mid 30s. So um, it's obviously also linked to hay fever. So children who have early onset hay fever um, are, are pretty much at a high risk of getting pollen food syndrome. And in fact, another study from Korea showed that children uh, as young as three or four years old were already sensitized to the profilin and PR10 allergens 
and already having symptoms of pollen food syndrome. And this is very important when we're thinking about diagnosing pollen food syndrome, which I'll come on to. So let's have a look at the foods and you can see that they vary depending on the allergen. So for silver birch, it's PR10 allergens that cross react with the birch pollen. And these are very typical uh, apples, pears, stone fruits, uh, tree nuts, but also some other uh, ones like celery and carrot and potatoes. Um, whereas for the profilins, again, it depends on where the profilins are coming from uh, as to what foods will be involved. And some uh, foods such as uh, carrot and celery are also common uh, foods causing uh, pollen food syndrome in mugwort sensitized patients, as well as those with birch pollen allergy. Um, this is a, another study which looked at the reported reactions to these different foods and you can see that apple is a very common um, food causing uh, reactions in all countries, uh, including the UK and the green. Um, uh, and uh, also, uh, but peach to a much lesser extent and carrot uh, really a much smaller amount whereas carrot was much more important in Austria, uh, as was walnut. So it can vary around the world, but generally, uh, depending on the sensitization to the pollen, uh, the reactions, the foods will be similar. So let's look at the other major fruit and vegetable allergy. Now this is lipid transfer protein allergy, a much, much newer concept in the UK. This is, uh, tends to have a slightly slower speed of onset within 30 minutes and a constellation of symptoms. So it can be mild in some people, but very severe in others. It involves some similar foods to pollen food syndrome, but importantly, uh, also foods like cabbage and tomatoes and uh, even cereal foods such as uh, wheat and barley. But it also involves the foods, not just when they're raw, but when they're also cooked or processed, because these allergens do not get destroyed on heating, unlike the allergens that cause pollen food syndrome. It's not traditionally been thought to, to be linked to pollen sensitization. Um, and it was originally thought to only occur in southern Europe. Now, uh, in this uh, map, which is taken from some work uh, we've done in Europe, looking at this uh, allergy, you can see that uh, where the levels are high in Spain and Italy, uh, and uh, in fact, a case series in Belgium also showed a, a strong level of sensitization to LTP allergens. In the UK, we've shown that it exists here in adults and also uh, there's been studies from other countries too, um, and single case reports. Now out of Europe, uh, we know that in China, uh, LTP allergy certainly exists there, and there's been one case report from Australia, but not from anywhere else in the world and not from America. Um, and so this is, makes it a very interesting proposition uh, because what we're not sure about is whether LTP allergy actually does exist in America or, or, whether they just, um, or whether they just haven't found it yet. So the symptoms are, as I say, are slightly different. They're more delayed. They can be localized or systemic and they can involve a whole spectrum, including oral symptoms, but particularly uh, urticaria in young children, um, but also eye swelling and severe abdominal pain and uh, anaphylaxis. So uh, we know that uh, studies have shown that these are people who do have more severe reactions. In one study, they found that 44% of patients had had anaphylaxis, whereas the others had really had much more mild skin or oropharyngeal reactions. Um, one study found that if you're sensitized to more than five different LTPs, you're more likely to have more severe reactions. And yet another one found that being uh, having positive tests to the peach and walnut lipid transfer proteins meant that you had a higher rate of food uh, induced reactions. Now, what about children? So actually we know that lipid transfer protein allergy sensitization occurs early in life. And in fact, um, 
often uh, affects a large number of children. Uh, one study in Italy found that nearly 20% of uh, the children studied had had reactions to foods caused by LTP allergy. But I have to say in children, it's often a quite a mild disease, uh, not necessarily causing the severe reactions that we see in adults. This was a study in Italy, which showed that the level of the LTP allergen pre-P3, the peach LTP, which is what they uh, were measuring, peaks uh, at the age of about 20 years and falls off after that. Now, interestingly, in the UK, the time that presentation of LTP allergy often occurs is around this age, the early 20s, which is very different to pollen food syndrome, which generally tends to present a little bit later on. We do know that in the UK, children are sensitized to lipid transfer proteins. Sean Ludman uh, showed this in her study in 2016, um, but we don't really know whether this is uh, sensitization without uh, uh, any symptoms or, or not. So the foods involved can uh, vary a lot. Um, uh, usually uh, there is concentration in the skin of the fruits like there is for pollen food syndrome. Um, uh, and so some of the foods are very similar. Um, peach, tree nuts, peanut, apple, hazelnuts are very common, but tomato is also very common. And that's not a common pollen food syndrome fruit. Um, so there tends to be a concentration of allergen uh, in the skin, as I said, but there also tends to be a lot of other foods that contain lipid transfer proteins that are very different to pollen food syndrome. And there has been some suggestion of certain foods that could be safe but this is very variable. Um, if we look at uh, three studies, so one from Spain, one from Italy, and one from the UK, we can see that although there are differences, uh, there are many similarities with tree nuts and peanuts being very predominant uh, and also apples uh, and uh, peaches. So what about pollens? So pollens we know are very important in pollen food syndrome, but are they important in uh, the development of lipid transfer protein allergy? Well, uh, we know that many people who are sensitive, who have LTP allergy in Spain, have a positive test to mugwort. So they are sensitized to that. And in China, uh, the study they did on peach allergy in China found that actually the, the main uh, allergen that started it all off was mugwort and the LTP in mugwort uh, presumably cross-reacting with peaches and causing that reaction. Um, mugwort and plain tree are very common pollen allergens in people with LTP allergy in both Italy and Spain and uh, we did a study in the UK and we found that again uh, our patients with LTP allergy were also often sensitized to these two allergens. It has been suggested that if, uh, if you have a patient who is also co-sensitized to the profilin and PR10 allergens, they have milder LTP symptoms, but that is not something we've seen in the UK patients. So we uh, took 35 patients who'd already had a diagnosis of LTP allergy and um, we uh, did various tests and we compared them to a group of uh, adults who had pollen food syndrome and also to a group of patients from Rome who had LTP allergy. And what we showed here is that um, although uh, many of our pollen food syndrome patients were sensitized to plain tree, actually all, almost all of our LTP patients were sensitized to plain tree and many of them to mugwort. But you can see they were also sensitized to birch and grass. Um, so uh, slightly different to the patients from Spain and Italy. The other important thing about LTP allergy is the involvement of cofactors. Cofactors um, are, as I said, exercise, alcohol or pain relief are just some of the cofactors, the most common ones. And we know that people with um, food dependent exercise induced anaphylaxis, uh, a large number of them had a positive test to LTPs. 
And often with LTP allergy, the first sign that someone has an LTP allergy is when they've had a food related reaction after exercise and you do a test for LTP and it's positive. This is uh, data again from our study, which showed that in LTP patients, uh, cofactors were common, uh, especially, especially uh, any exertion, uh, but also alcohol. Um, uh, although interestingly, some of the pollen food syndrome patients also felt their reactions were linked to cofactors. So diagnosis is uh, the key here to thinking about the difference between these three uh, types of allergy. So pollen food syndrome, lipid transfer protein allergy, or a primary allergy to fruits or to peanuts and tree nuts. So when we're looking at differences between pollen food syndrome and lipid transfer protein allergy, and this is data from that study that I've just been talking about, um, in terms of um, reacting to raw or cooked foods, almost all of the patients with pollen food syndrome only reacted to the food when it was raw, whereas for the lipid transfer protein patients, it was uh, really about a quarter. And this is the speed of onset. So here you can see for pollen food syndrome, uh, almost the vast majority of about 80 to 90% reacted within five minutes. So either they were immediate or within five minutes. Whereas for lipid transfer protein, only a very small number reacted within uh, five minutes. It was a third of patients. The rest uh, were much slower onset. Looking at the trigger foods, can you get a clue from that? Well, actually, no. Uh, this is data again from that study and the patients with pollen food syndrome uh, reacted to pretty similar foods to those with LTP allergy. So tree nuts and peanuts, apples and stone fruits. But actually, tomato was uh, a very common LTP food and kiwi more likely in pollen food syndrome. So there were some differences there. And looking at symptoms, well, again, the patients often had similar range of symptoms, but with uh, the LTP patients, they all had quite severe uh, reactions that um, were not seen really in the pollen food syndrome patients. So wheezing, uh, uh, facial swelling, chest tightness, all of those were much more common in the lipid transfer protein group. Now, the problem with uh, diagnosis of any plant food is that when you're sensitized to a pollen like birch pollen, you will almost always have a positive skin prick or blood test to nuts. And this has been shown very nicely in this very large study looking at the skin prick test results from 114,000 children and adults. And you can see that over 80% of those with a birch sensitization were sensitized to hazelnut. And the same problem exists for LTP. Uh, one group of patients with LTP, 13% of them were sensitized, but they weren't symptomatic. And it's important to remember that just because someone has a positive test to an LTP or to uh, a nut, it doesn't mean that that is caused, that they've got LTP allergy or a nut allergy. It may all be due to cross reactivity. Foods more likely to be positive in LTP patients uh, include the peach reagent that we use. This is a, a particular reagent um, uh, which only contains two allergens and one is an LTP and the other is a, a very uncommon allergen. So all of our patients with LTP allergy had, a, almost all of them had a positive test to that, whereas none of the patients with pollen food syndrome did. You can see here that the common foods positive in LTP patients, but not in pollen food syndrome so much were cabbage and lettuce, mustard, raspberry, walnut and barley. So a very different group of foods to those we look for in pollen food syndrome. Um, and blood tests again, uh, the patients with pollen food syndrome more likely to be sensitive to the allergens, these PR10 allergens such as CORE1, MALD1, PRUP1, whereas the LTP patients more likely to be sensitized 
to the LTP allergens, but also many were sensitized to uh, the PR10 allergens too. And when we compared our group with the Rome patients, there was absolutely no difference between them. This uh, graph on the right is a, uh, a kind of representation of the Isaac microarray, which looks at all these individual allergens. And you can see that although the UK group had a lot more PR10 foods, they also had just as many lipid transfer protein uh, positive tests uh, to plants and to the foods as well. So no difference between them. So the LTP is a, is a pretty common universal problem, uh, whichever country it's in. Nuts are the issue often. Tree nuts and peanuts are often reported to provoke reactions in those with pollen food syndrome or LTP allergy, but they may get diagnosed with a nut allergy because the test is positive. And so what's really helpful in determining whether someone with pollen food syndrome actually is allergic to nuts rather than having pollen food syndrome is to look at the individual allergens. And this shows the allergens for peanut and the allergen ARAH2 has been shown to be a very good marker of peanut allergy, whereas ARAH8 is more likely to be positive in people who have pollen food syndrome who would have a negative test at ARAH2. The uh, LTP allergen ARAH9 is also useful in looking for LTP allergy. And the same is true for hazelnut, again, CORE14, CORE1, and also CORE8, the LTP. Um, so uh, in, our, uh, uh, in our hospital, we... Um, have some data here uh, which shows patients who had a peanut challenge and this was to say do they have a peanut allergy or do they have pollen food syndrome we weren't looking for LTP allergy in these patients and you can see that those who had a positive food challenge did have often a positive skin prick test whereas the ARAH2 and ARAH8 were not such good markers but for those who had a negative challenge uh, you can see that skin prick tests and specific Ig were not good markers of patients who might have a negative challenge, whereas ARAH2 was a very good marker. So almost all of the patients who had a negative challenge to peanuts did not have a positive test to ARAH2, whereas quite a number of them did have a positive test to ARAH8. So for peanut, ARAH2 is a very good marker of an allergy to peanuts. Uh, looking at hazelnut, we've done the same thing, whereas in this case, uh, all of the subjects we tested had a negative food challenge. And you can see the same problem that uh, the, particularly the blood test here uh, was positive in, in a, quite a number of people, whereas CORE14 was uh, again almost universally uh, negative in people who uh, had a negative challenge to hazelnut. So CORE14 and ARAH2, these uh, individual allergens, are really useful when you're trying to distinguish between um, pollen food syndrome and um, a nut uh, or a peanut allergy. Um, and so uh, here you can see them all and the other useful allergens uh, are the individual allergens in birch pollen, especially BET V1, which is the major allergen that causes pollen food syndrome in the UK, but also PRU-P3, a really good marker for lipid transfer protein allergy. So, and this is important because obviously the way we manage a nut allergy is completely different often to the way we might manage pollen food syndrome or lipid transfer protein allergy. Um, and, you know, basically a lot of this, the, the information is the same, avoid the foods that have caused symptoms, but you don't need to avoid all of the foods that might cause symptoms, um, because uh, that would certainly involve a lot of foods. Whereas for pollen food syndrome, actually peeling the food, microwaving it, cooking it, can often mean that the person will eat that food Whereas for lipid transfer protein, 
cooking does not mean there's no lipid transfer protein. And in fact, when they, they looked at tin tomatoes and the only allergen in there was a lipid transfer protein. So lipid transfer protein allergies in raw and cooked foods and, and even in very quite processed foods. For both groups, cooked or roasted nuts can still cause a problem. And that's because in pollen food syndrome, those allergens may not be universally uh, destroyed because there's so much protein in a nut. Um, there's no need to avoid botanical uh, relatives. And for both groups, there are differences between different varieties of foods. So uh, apples, may have different levels of allergen for both pollen food syndrome and LTP. Um, and um, actually the other thing is storage. Stored apples are much higher in MALD1, which is the pollen food syndrome cross-reactive allergen in apples. Whereas for LTP, the uh, level of LTP goes down. It's much higher when you pick the fruit off the tree. Um, so if you have LTP allergy and you go to Spain for your holidays and go picking uh, some nice peaches from the tree, you're more likely to have a more severe reaction than eating one that's been in the supermarket here for a number of weeks. Um, so I didn't, I nearly finished, but I just wanted to mention, of course, there are many other hidden plant food allergens that can cause reactions and have been known to, and Obviously, some of these have to be labelled, but not all of them do. So uh, although we concentrated today on these particular ones, um, it is important because, of course, with so many people becoming vegan, the use of things like pea protein, uh, mycoproteins, and also many people uh, avoiding wheat, uh, we have much more use of buckwheat um, and lupin. So I think it is important to remember that there can be a number of foods that can cause plant food allergy uh, as well. So I wanted to finish by uh, just, this is my wonderful team that I work with at the Royal Brompton and uh, Professor Stephen Durham has been my mentor and friend for almost 40 years, um, a wonderful team to work with. So I'm going to leave you with the uh, anaphylaxis campaign information. Um, it's a marvelous organization, as Lynn said, I've worked with you for many years and I just was delighted when you asked me to give this lecture so many thanks. Thank you so much Isabel for that excellent presentation which was extremely wide-ranging lots and lots of information there um, I didn't want to put Isabel off but this like many of our other webinars was oversubscribed and looking at the sort of data as you were going through, the numbers listening, uh, people joined and they stuck with it right to the end. So uh, clearly this is a topic that people really, really want to know um, a lot about. So thank you, Isabel. Um, we've had lots and lots of questions um, on this topic. And I think what I'll do is I will just choose a few because I know that you have actually, um, probably there are lots of questions, <laughs> lots of coming while you've been talking as well. And, and you've addressed a lot of the issues in your presentation. We will make the presentation, um, uh, this presentation available on our website and the Q&A will be available to, to all our members as well. So um, there will be an opportunity to get those answers, but I'll, I'll pick a few of the questions out for you, Isabel. Um, and one of the questions that I know we get asked on our helpline quite a lot as well is, is latex allergy particularly connected to pollen food syndrome? Well, it's a very good question. Um, it is uh, connected in the way that it's a cross-reactive allergy, just like pollen food syndrome is cross-reactive and LTP allergy is cross-reactive. So there are allergens in latex uh, that cross-react with food. Uh, there are, uh, there are um, profilins in latex, um, so it can be part of the profilin allergy. Um, there are also um, LTPs in latex, there's an LTP allergen, so that can also be a problem. Um, but, you know, there are also uh, particular allergens that are very similar uh, in latex to banana and avocado, uh, 
which makes that the common uh, and kiwi, which makes those common foods that can cause more severe reactions. So yes, latex is part of that. It, it's not pollen related because uh, latex uh, allergy comes through a slightly different route of contact rather than breathing it in. But it is definitely a cross react, can be a cross reactive allergy. Thank you for that. Um, another question, um, which I think is a very interesting one, is, is LTP allergy becoming more common or is it just now being more recognised? Uh, well, again, another great question. I think um, it's becoming more recognised. Uh, when I started my work in LTP allergy, which was uh, a long time ago now, there was real surprise from uh, particularly the people in Italy and Spain, that we had LTP allergy. They was, it was convinced, even there was even a paper published recently that said, why is LTP allergy only present in Southern European countries? Um, I think it's, uh, I think it's a, a lot more prevalent than we thought. I think there may have been in the past people diagnosed with, for example, anaphylaxis that was caught, thought to be idiopathic or no known cause that could have had an LTP allergy. It, it, it's a really difficult allergy to diagnose and, and manage, but I think, we, I think there's a lot more awareness of it now. I've had a fantastic um, meeting with the anaphylaxis group up in Glasgow who are seeing a lot of LTP allergy. I think more people are testing for it. Um, I think we have to be careful to make sure that we are testing for it and uh, not just thinking a positive test suggests they've got LTP allergy because many uh, patients um, can be sensitized to both LTP allergy and also have pollen food syndrome. So there can be people who have both, but also there are people who may just have a positive test to an LTP, but it's not clinically relevant. So as with any food allergy, it's the history that's really important. But I suspect this LTP story uh, has got a long way to, to run yet. Um, and um, we are about to publish two papers from the European Academy from a task force that I led on LTP allergy. So if people are interested, uh, they'll be coming out hopefully in the early in the new year. Thank you, Isabel. I mean, it's great that there are people like yourself who have expertise now in this area because um, as we know, allergy services, particularly for adults across the UK, are not <laughs> that widely that widely spread. So having people like yourselves and um, who are doing all this in-depth research and really knowledgeable about the topic and spreading that knowledge is, fan is fantastic. Um, I'll go on to uh, another question. Do reactions as a result of pollen food syndrome, syndrome or LTP allergy always happen immediately or can they be delayed? So um, with pollen food syndrome, usually the reactions are pretty quick. So if somebody says, I ate a hazelnut and within within a minute, my tongue started to feel itchy um, and, I, and I started to have feelings in my throat. I, I, that's usually much more likely to be pollen related. Uh, but what can happen is sometimes people can have those early onset symptoms like they can in a peanut allergy, but then they also get later symptoms. So it may be that uh, you, you know, uh, you do get early onset symptoms in LTP allergy as well. And whether that's because they're also sensitized to the pollen related allergens or, or not, I, I don't know. But with pollen food syndrome, as I showed in the, the talk, typically, and this was in um, a lot of patients, that we studied, um, the reactions all, almost always happened within five minutes. Uh, and this was when we'd actually done food challenges on those patients as well. Whereas with lipid transfer protein, it, it does tend to be slightly delayed. And that may be because the allergy, the symptoms are sort of acute abdominal pain, but some people do say they get that pretty early on. So, uh, but usually quick for pollen food syndrome, not quite so quick for LTP.
And as you can imagine, a lot of the questions, because we are the anaphylaxis campaign uh, coming in, have actually been about anaphylaxis. And mm -hmm. you have answered the question um, that you can indeed have anaphylaxis. Um, but the, the thing that people are asking is, how do I know if I should carry adrenaline? Ah, uh -huh. the, 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 the big question, isn't it? It's yeah. always for any patient that I see. Um, it's interesting because in Italy and Spain, uh, LTP allergy isn't always considered to be uh, an immediate, you must have an EpiPen question, you know, if you've got LTP allergy, because there a lot of the children who have it have, do have very mild symptoms. So I think, again, it, it comes back down to not if is this pollen food syndrome or LTP allergy, but what were the symptoms? What was the food? How likely is that person to have a reaction again? In other words, is it something that's very easy to avoid or difficult to avoid? Does that person also have asthma? You know, what was the most severe reaction that they had? I think rarely in this country do people with pollen food syndrome uh, are, are, rarely are they given uh, uh, adrenaline auto injectors and I think that's most of the time that's correct but we definitely see people who've had much more severe reactions um, um, who may have asthma who, who may be at a high risk maybe going to a country where they're going to eat different foods and they won't know whether some of those foods like jackfruit could cause a much more severe reaction. So it, as always, it's very individual. What I would say is for LTP allergy, we're probably, I would say our LTP patients are more likely to have adrenaline auto injectors because their reaction that they presented with was is usually a much more severe reaction. So, um, but I don't automatically give it, if, I, if it's LTP allergy, they don't automatically get a, an injector. But the one thing that I would say is, it is incredibly difficult to predict what else is going to cause a reaction. Now this goes for pollen food syndrome as well, which is why we always tell people when they're trying a new fruit or a nut um, to be very cautious whether they've got pollen food syndrome or LTP allergy. But for those with LTP allergy who've had severe reactions, it's really hard to know what else might not cause a severe reaction. So I would say they were the group that we're more likely to advise to carry adrenaline. And it, it highlights as well, doesn't it, how important it is that um, if somebody suspects that they are reacting um, to the foods as you've described, that they go along and they see their general practitioner as a first step and that they do get a referral if possible to a, a specialist uh, clinic in secondary care so mm. that, that these sorts of debates and discussions can take place because we know that carrying adrenaline has, has a big impact on mm. people's lives and behaviours so it's not a decision that should be taken without proper discussion and debate with uh, with experts so um that that's it was a great answer thank you for that isabel um the next one i'd like to ask you is um one that's come in what test should i be given to diagnose if i have pollen food syndrome so for pollen food syndrome the the best test is the history that you give you know, um, and usually it's, uh, I bit into an apple and I got an itchy mouth. I ate a handful of hazelnuts and I had an immediately lip and mouth swelling, but I can eat an apple pie and I can eat Nutella. So, you know, it's the history in pollen food syndrome that is absolutely really key because people with pollen food syndrome will be will have positive tests to pollens. As I said in the talk, they will also probably have positive tests to lots of different foods because of cross reactivity. So it, a positive test does not mean you are allergic to that food unless you've had symptoms to it. So it's really important that whoever they're seeing takes a really good history um, because then they'll understand which foods might be the problem uh, and to do the right tests. 
um, with pollen food syndrome because it so often happens that people will have lots of positive tests and they've cut all of those foods out. Usually what I do is I, I use the individual allergens that I talked about um, to show them that actually some nuts are fine in pollen food syndrome, like cashew and pistachio nuts are almost always tolerated um, and uh, often seeds are tolerated as well. Um, so I think it's really important that the history is the giveaway. Um, testing uh, is really secondary in pollen food syndrome. And that, that actually holds for all uh, types of uh, uh, allergy food, mm, doesn't it? Absolutely. We hear time and time again that clinicians uh, say that the most important thing is, is the history. Yeah. And listening and finding out what the story is behind um, the issue that has happened. So that, that's a, a message that resonates across mm. the piece, I think. Um, the next one um, is, is there, is there any plan to trial oral immunotherapy to LTP in the UK? Um, there have been studies in Spain where desensitization has been carried out using peach juice um, and then patients were then able to consume all foods they previously reacted to. That sounds quite like a quite a detailed question. Uh, I don't know if you can answer that one. Oh, but, I can answer uh, that one. Yes, I know, I'm, <laughs> I know the people well who did the Spanish studies, marvellous research. Um, I think what I would say is in Spain, most people are get uh, an LTP allergy because of peaches um, and they're all sensitized to peaches. So if you desensitize them with peach juice, then a lot of them will uh, have no problem after that because often it is just one food, it, it's just mm. peaches. Now, um, I know the peach juice study and I, I'm not sure whether they were able to eat all of the foods that they were avoiding. I know there has been uh, an immunotherapy study uh, looking at how effective giving uh, PRU-P3, which is the peach LTP allergen, we know it's very effective in enabling people to eat peaches again, but actually what they found was that it also worked in people who had reactions to peanuts. And, and this was really groundbreaking because, you know, uh, often with these, uh, types of cross reactions, uh, you, can, you can sort one thing out, but it's all the other foods that may not be affected. So I think there is very promising research out there. Uh, I am very keen to do it. I'm very keen to collaborate with the Spanish and we were hoping to have a collaboration, but uh, after this year, I'm afraid it, it just didn't happen. So I think for all of the patients that I see, and I talk a lot about immunotherapy to patients, I think the immunotherapy for LTP allergy is probably, I would consider really worthwhile. Uh, I don't always say that about immunotherapy, but I think in this case, because there's so many foods, the element of difficulty in knowing which foods might cause a reaction and the cofactor response, make it a really hard allergy to manage and to live with. So I do hope we will get some something on the horizon uh, with regards to immunotherapy in the next couple of years. Yes, I mean, this is obviously a hot topic in, in other types of allergy mm. as well. So that's very positive news. And linked with that, and I'll make this the last uh, question, I think, Isabel, but, and what we'll do, because we have got several more, is we'll incorporate those into our into our Q and A. But this this year is one from somebody who said, "My 14 year old has been diagnosed with suspected LTP allergy, and we're finding it really difficult to know what it's safe for her to eat. The list of foods with LTP is daunting, and I think we saw that in your presentation." What's the best way to manage this condition? Okay, well, yes, it's, it is very difficult. And, and I see a lot of patients referred from elsewhere because it is so difficult. And 
Um, of course, as a dietitian, I'm really, I feel, you know, really good dietary advice is so important. I think with LTP allergy, um, in the UK, there's a list of foods we think are safe. I did allude to some of them in the talk. Um, but of course, that's not the same for every uh, different country. A lot depends on what the allergen is that you're primarily sensitized to, and you may not know that. So I think what I would say is, um, there is a list of foods. Um, I'm not sure, Lynn, if you've done a, a sheet on LTP allergy um, for the anaphylaxis campaign, but I'm very happy to share the one that I wrote uh, following the research um, because, you know, there are definitely foods that seem to cause more problems. I would say um, certain fruits, the soft fruits, the stone fruits, um, and also things like cabbage and lettuce, uh, raspberries, you know, those are all foods that I know have come up quite often. Um, so, you know, that, but there are a lot of foods that people can eat and obviously it's very difficult. I can't obviously give individual advice because for LTP allergy, it varies hugely. So what I would say is that, um, you know, there are definitely foods that are more likely to be safe uh, I'm very happy to share our information sheet um, with the anaphylaxis campaign so that people can have access to information. I would stress that the information in it is based a lot on the patients that we've seen um, and they are adults. And so it may be that our experience is not the same as it is in other parts of the country or in other parts of Europe. And I think that is a really important issue that, you know, what, it's not like you're allergic to peanuts and it doesn't matter where you are in the world, mm. you'll avoid peanuts. For these kind of allergies, LTP and pollen food syndrome, a lot depends on what you're sensitized to as to what's going to cause a problem. And for that, you do need some uh, expert advice. So happy to share the information sheet that, that we have. That's very generous, Isabel. And we will certainly take you up on that. Um, I think we do have a fact sheet, but these things are perpetually moving face. And I think that we will, uh, after this um, webinar, we'll take a step back and look at our information and certainly take you up on that offer. Uh, as I say, we will also make this webinar available um, because it's been packed full of information. And as I say, people have been listening from start to finish. So you've obviously held everybody's um attention so thank you for that it's been a great webinar thank you for giving us all your time and being so generous with um your expertise as well uh, after this webinar if people want to look at um the webinar again we'll put it up also if they want to see the q a they need to go to our website www.anaphylaxis.org.uk and there'll be further information. So thank you very much, Isabel. That's been fantastic. Thank you so much for taking part in this webinar. And thank you to everybody out there for listening. Thank you, Lynn. Thank Thanks you. for inviting me. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.